Well, um, welcome everybody. Um, I'm delighted to see um, so many people, uh, and particularly delighted actually there are so many people from different departments, which is precisely what we always wanted to do with uh, this series, Making Space for Art, which is in its third year, uh, thanks to the very generous support of uh, HARC, um, Humanities and Arts uh, Research Centre, which is a you know, it's beautiful, very sort of dynamic interdisciplinary centre, which has been uh, supporting us now for um, for a while. Um, I'm the head of the School of Modern Languages, Literatures and Cultures, and I just simply happen to be uh, one of the founding uh, members of this project, Making Space for Art. Um, uh, the other person is my colleague, um, Eric Robertson, and the third person is uh, kind of in, in spirit and physically also with us because he's the curator of the picture gallery. At the moment, you know, the former curator who's uh, um, uh, away at the moment, you know, was one of the kind of initial team of people involved. And Harriet, the current curator, is also uh, collaborating with us. So that's, that's great. And uh, um, um, I'm not going to introduce the speakers. All I want to say is that I hope that you keep following us. There are other events that will be happening uh, this term and, uh, uh, and next term, and uh, uh, the, the um, HARC will very efficiently, as usual, uh, send uh, reminders around. But in a sense, you know, what I'd like to ask you is if you've not been to one of our uh, seminars before, just keep us on, on your radar. I know you're very busy and there's so much to do on, uh, on campus, but it's, it's great to, uh, to have you know, a, a sort of uh, nice, lively audience. And uh, with the series, we've done lots of different things. We've had lots of talks from curators, uh, although that was never necessarily our you know, intention. Our intention is really to open up a debate about the physical and metaphorical uses of space um, um, and art. And so sometimes you know, people have interpreted that very literally in terms of you know, uh, what do you do if you've got a collection with certain historic spaces and uh, how do you curate in those spaces. Um, but we've also had interesting discussions about what is the space um, of, for instance, female artists, and we had a, a wonderful talk on the Scottish female um, painters, you know, and how do you create a, an art historical space for that? Um, and today, and I'm really excited about that, we're moving into a different idea of, uh, of an exploration of space, also with a slightly different format to the talk, um, a, an in-conversation format. And I will um, let my colleague introduce the speakers and the talk today. Great. So, um, I'm Cecilia, I'm a cultural geographer at the geography department here at Royal Holloway, so talking about space, and here I am. Um, so, I'm having the, the pleasure to be the discussant tonight, so I will just do a quick presentation of the two speakers, and then they will get to have their conversation, and then I'll come with a reflection from my own place and space. And then we will open up for questions from the audience. So uh, James here is, well, let me first say the title, even though it's there. So this is about Shoreditch Bridge Portraits. And um, this is a series of portraits taken by John Perry Volaris right here. And he will be in conversation with James Kent right here. So James, for those of you who doesn't know him, he is based in the School of Modern Languages, Literatures and Cultures, and he's specializing in Cuban visual cultures, and in particularly film and photography with a focus on the city of Havana. Yep. And also, he is also a practicing photographer, and he has exhibited his work in the UK and in Cuba. And then we have John here, who is a lot of things, See, <laughs> when I was Googling you. So, um, an independent documentary and fine art photographer, a curator, a writer, a researcher, an educator, and also organizer of photographic events um, with a background in Hispanic cultural and visual studies. Um, and he's done a range of product, uh, projects all over the world um, and working a lot on the topic of migrant communities and promoting work in visual arts by migrants, refugees and asylum seekers, among others. But today we will talk about a more contemporary project um, in London and I'll leave to James to talk more about that work. Okay. Thank you, Cecilia. Um, well, I'm thrilled that... Thank you all for coming. 
Sorry to say again, just to reiterate what Juliana just said, but to see so many students and colleagues after a busy day of meetings, it's, it's really great to see you here. Um, I'm thrilled that John can be with us today for this In Conversation event relating to this series, Shoreditch Bridge Portrait. It's a fascinating sequence of images, in my opinion, that now represents a very substantial and a rich body of work. And before we start the conversation element of this event, I just wanted to mention how it is we've come to, how we sort of formed this uh, discussion and conversation in recent months. Um, and I think somewhat unconsciously, perhaps, um, we began to explore the ways in which the series or sequence as well, which is how we'll describe it, um, relates to the theme of making space for art. And it is our intention today to flesh out some of these ideas um, in the conversation. We've used an app called Mammoth, um, which serves as a sort of digital notebook, a mood board. You can ask questions, um, write notes, put photographs on it, and things like that. Um, but we've used that to start discussing the work virtually um, over the web um, and discussing John's work, but also discussing our sort of shared photographic practice. Um, and this online conversation is going to form the basis for what we initially explore today. Um, so we'll plan on sort of going through that for sort of 20, 30 minutes maybe um, before having time for um, a reflection from Cecilia and, and questions. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, I brought along a little sheet um, as I'm, I don't want, I'm hesitant to say mailing list, but for anyone that would be interested in receiving the link to the Mammoth page, which is this, this discussion, uh, and or receiving the other links um, for John's photographs, and then please just note your name and email, and then we'll, we'll send those through to you. So that we'll just pass that around. Um, and the other thing is, John's kindly brought around some um, postcards of photographs from the series. And I thought it'd be nice if we just distribute those. Feel free to keep those as a memento of the event. And I thought it'd be nice to have something tangible in front of, in front of us. Um, so just as by way of a quick introduction, fittingly, I think this conversation began under a bridge, under the bridge in Shoreditch. Um, I was at the time a postgrad here at Royal Holloway, and I'd been introduced to John um, by Dr. Sarah Wright. Um, and I went to meet John in Shoreditch under the bridge. And I've watched the sequence build and grow over the last five years to what it's now become. And during this time, the growing number of portraits has crept steadily towards uh, the 300 mark. I think we're at 271, yeah. you say? Yeah. So we're at 29 off completion. John's 29 off completion. I'll come back to why I'm using our... Um, but I feel very privileged to um, have been witness and participant. Um, and at times, and I, again I say this with hesitation, but a sort of collaborator um, uh, in this series of Shoreditch Bridge Portraits. Uh, and as a photographer, what I wanted to say is that I've taken so much from the experience. Of, of witnessing this take place. And for me personally, therefore, the bridge in Shoreditch represents a sort of anchor, a point of return um, from which collaborations, friendships, and relationships have developed. I think that's really important just to say right at the very beginning. And I feel deeply attached now to this sequence of images um, as I feel I've been part of it in many ways. Um, and it is an ongoing dialogue between all these different things, concrete and light, people in the city, and the photographs tell a story of all number of different journeys, of the photographer himself, of the characters that are photographed, seen in the portraits, and everything else, and everyone else, that are sort of unseen in these photographs. So I think we'll probably come on to that and begin, as I say, to flesh out some of these ideas. Um, but to begin the conversation, I just wanted John to kick things off by speaking a little bit about how the project came about. Um, yeah, I'll head over to you. Yeah, thank you, James. Um, I, and I very much consider you one of my uh, collaborators in, in this project. Um, now, uh, this project emerged out of a previous one. Um, and it was the reason why I was in this location in the first place. And the previous project was a, a commission I, I had in 2010 uh, from Corner House Gallery in Manchester to undertake a, a journey um, of a month's length um, from a northern city, Manchester, 
to a North African city, uh, Algiers. And I undertook this journey from the, the steps of Corner House Gallery. I was sent off by the curator um, with my equipment or my luggage and went on this uh, month-long journey by ship and, and rail. Uh, first of all, going down to London, then spending some time in Calais, down to Paris, then down to Marseille, then by ship to Algiers, and then from Algiers, I actually did a detour, went off to the Tunisian border where I, I took a, a photograph in the same location that, um, of a photograph of my father, who was a, a sailor, taken uh, in 1949 but in the lighthouse of Annaba. Um, so that project is fairly typical of the type of stuff I do, which involves journeys, mobility, uh, transportation, migration, those sort of themes. Um, now, the reason I was in passing by this bridge uh, for a long period of time in sort of autumn, winter uh, 2010 was because I was using a darkroom um, nearby to print up, to make the exhibition prints for that exhibition, which was called North to North, uh, for, for this exhibition in Manchester. And I was passing by this bridge constantly uh, and noticing, well, like all photography should, every sequence of photographs should begin with light. So the thing that struck me was, was the light under this bridge. Um, and the concrete, the way the concrete uh, itself as a material um, would change color, texture, mood, uh, according to the time of day, according to the season. So, you, you know, uh, I've been photographing this bridge now since 2011, February 2011. That's the first photograph. And every time I go there, the, the, the material, of, first of all, it's aged. There are marks, handprints, um, bits of graffiti which have been painted out. Um, you know, there obviously there are different people there, but it's the it's first of all it's the light. You know, that's why I decided from the outset. Would you leave it on the on the yeah. first image because I think that's significant. The um, um, yeah, the uh, the light changes seasonally. So so at this time of the year, it goes from being a warmish color to and it starts going. Uh, turning to more towards the blue side of the of the color spectrum, um, so I decided it had to be in color. So everything that this project became is really there in embryo in this very first image, and I didn't know this would be a sequence of three hundred images when I took this picture, <laughs> because um, I agree in some ways with Diane Arbus. I, 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 that's why I don't like calling these projects. Project seems to imply that you know what you're going to get at the end of it and that you work towards it. And, and rather, I prefer to go on a journey. And, and a journey for me, by definition, is somewhere where the destin you don't know where the destination is. Um, so I always, I always go... And who better, really? I always go with what Diane Arbus said. And I'll, I'll read you the, the quotation um, because I think it's, um, for me, it's a good recipe if I can find it. Just bear with me a second. Well, this is what Arbus said. She said, the Chinese have a theory that you pass through boredom into fascination, and I think it's true. I would never choose a subject for what it means to me or what I think about it. You see, that would be a project, in, I, I believe. She goes on, you've just got to choose a subject, and I chose a subject, and what you feel about it, what it means, begins to unfold if you just plain choose a subject and do it enough. 
And that's why I've been doing it every month <laughs> since 2011 and been very bored a lot of the time. But I've passed through that stage into, into this stage of fascination now. As this project is, is coming to its end, I'm really regretting that it's coming to an end because now is when it is be, beginning to be interesting for me. Now, in terms of, of, of the, the significance of this first picture and the reason I'm dwelling on it so long is that, you know, obviously I, you don't know what you're doing uh, at the beginning of a sequence of images. You don't even know that it's going to be a sequence of images. So I was there with my prints of Algeria under one arm and a compact camera, digital camera in the other arm. And for, it, it was the light. Uh, it was the light, it was the color of the bridge, it was the actual material presence of the bridge that made me, stopped me in my tracks under a bridge. And a bridge is significant, especially a bridge as nondescript as, as this one, a concrete bridge nobody ever stops under, unless, and this is since austerity, I've noticed more and more, unless you're living there, of course. Uh, and the latter part of the, of the sequence has increasingly large numbers of, of rough sleepers in it. Uh, to the point where they consider this home. And when I go there, as I will go tomorrow, I always have to, I always uh, tell them I'm there and ask their permission almost to take the pictures in their living space, basically. Um, so the, the other thing was optically, you know, in practical terms, to make the most interesting pictures you can, you have to work out how you're going to do this thing. Now, what I liked about this compact camera, which you can't really see here, um, is that this compact camera I used a lot at that time had 16-9 aspect ratio. 16-9, I mean, the standard compact camera is 4-3, which is a sort of squarish uh, frame. Um, 3.2 is the standard 35 millimeter frame. 16.9 is what we commonly know as widescreen. Mm. It's the sort of cinema scope uh, format, um, which, I th which suited, and the early part of the project is shot on 16.9 largely because it's bridge-like, it spans across, so in terms of the space, it, it, cre it actually visually creates this sense of a bridge, of a space, of a stage, of a frame within which the actors take their place. And, and there is a performative aspect to this as well, uh, not just on their part, but also on my part. Uh, th there, a performance takes place when you're under a bridge, which is this transit space, and you're interrupting the flow, and you come to a standstill. Um, you stand still in a, in a, in a, you know, in the, in a capitalist city where everything is based on flow. Uh, everything is geared towards channeling people through to stop is actually a, a very radical act. Um, stillness and and photography in itself is is interesting in that respect and that's why i chose to take still pictures rather than shoot video because i think the the, the very fact of a photograph stillness is is interesting and very uh, potent uh, also on a political level uh, so maybe yeah and would it be worth um, just clarifying where this bridge is exactly in terms yes. of location in London. Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. Um, the other reason I suppose I chose this location is because th this bridge, you might know it, is actually the, bri the first bridge you come across when you come out of Liverpool Street Station, you head towards Shoreditch High Street. There's a building there called the T Building, 
it's an iconic sort of, it used to be a tea warehouse, I think, in the, in the sort of 19th century. There's Box Park there, and then there's Shoreditch Station. It's the, virtually the first bridge you come to. So it's actually uh, at a place which is interesting because it captures a very varied, and it's a point of transit between very different demographics. On one side of, of this junction, uh, um, you have uh, two or three council estates. Uh, as you're heading towards it from Liverpool Street, on the left you have Hoxton, so you have the whole hipster republic there, you know, Hoxton and all the very sort of arty types, you know, very multinational, very cosmopolitan. And then on the other, as you're approaching, of course, is the city of London. So it's corporate London. So you have all these people using this, this bridge. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, is, is interesting as well. Because then it, the project becomes, because I think we're going to go on and talk about this business, mm -hmm. if it, less street photography and more like something um, that August Zander would do would have done in Germany, you know, in the thirties, a, a sort of encyclopedic sort of survey of, um, in my case, on a smaller scale, not of a nation, but maybe of part of a city at a certain moment in time. And one of the things I wanted to get onto was just thinking about the more interesting interactions you've had under the bridge. And as I've said, I've been I've watched John taking photographs there under bridges, that's usually our sort of meeting point before we've been to visit exhibitions or whatever. Um, and often I've been there to photograph, there's a, there's a photograph at the end of this um, presentation of, that I've taken of John actually at work, which is quite interesting, we'll come on to that. Um, but I think it's interesting to talk a little bit about the way you interact with, with these characters or participants, whatever you want to call them. Um, and. I also wanted just to say that I selected some of the images from the 271, um, and I hadn't sort of cherry picked them. They're sort of random, so but it, it it's I think it's um, representative of how there are sort of stories attached to all these different photographs, and that John has, has said things in our online conversation that are pretty pretty amazing actually. So um, this this photograph. This photograph, yeah. Again, this shot, uh, 916 format, so it's 16-9, but in portrait mode. And it's not a format you would usually use for this type of picture. But you'll notice the lines of the concrete, the lines of the paving form a, an interesting sort of perspective. And that, that's what I'm playing with when I'm using this format. Now, this, um, <laughs> this young woman I photographed on Valentine's Day, 2011. And about 18 months later, I bumped into her again under the bridge, which is increasingly happening more and more. I'm coming across the same people. Um, sometimes, you know, people who would rather not have their photograph taken the first time I saw them, but 18 months later, they actually said, yeah, I'm ready now. Uh, that's happened a lot. Um, now, when I bumped into her again 18 months later, she told me, that later on the same day as the photograph was, was taken, she found out she was pregnant. Um, and she was now the, the proud mother of a healthy baby boy, which was a nice story in itself. But I have to wonder about the magical properties of taking someone's picture. Um, I believe that the Immaculate Conception is often portrayed in painting by a heavenly illumination. Um, yeah, light again, and never underestimate the properties of light. I mean, Paul himself, in chapter five of his letter to the Ephesians, it, it exhorts us to live as children of the light. Well, this is a good example, I suppose. And I wonder if you might mention as well how the bridge has changed uh, over yeah. the years. You mentioned austerity, and we've been through. If you think about five years in London, the times have changed drastically. Um, Mm. And whether, yeah, just, and, I mean, it, and visually, I, I've noticed how the, and John's already touched on this, but how visually the space has changed. Yeah. When, the, when you think about graffiti or it's been painted in different ways. And thinking about the bridge as a sort of 
a canvas, a blank canvas that's been used in different ways. I think it's an interesting idea. Well, maybe this isn't the best phase because this is an, uh, one earlier on. I mean, the, it, the main, that's an interesting, that one gives you quite a good impression of, of the bridge, the space of the bridge as a proscenium march or as a, as a frame, as a stage. Um, but in general terms, I, I suppose the biggest change is, is homelessness and the way the bridge has actually in, in not that long a time become a far grottier in its sort of appearance. And there are periodic sort of efforts at cleaning it up. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I remember bringing up in our conversation before was thinking about um, the photograph and photography's presence in the art world and how these images might be read in different ways by different audiences. Um, and I think you sort of touched upon the idea of, of how you felt about photography and, and art. Mm. Yeah. I feel, I think probably, similarly to the sort of idea of photography as art, as I feel about the idea that um, Bob Dylan needs to be given the Nobel Prize for us to take his lyrics seriously. It, it, it's a sort of... Um, I think photography doesn't need to be an art. I mean, um, uh, let me see what we say. We had an interesting conversation of, about this. Um, yeah, it's further off. Yeah. Where I think you, you on purposely sort of um, tried to get under my skin and I went off on one. Um, yeah, I, th I think I replied to you. You said to me, um, Mm. Yeah, and my reply to, to your question was I'm less interested in photography's place in the art world and more interested in photography as a language. And I suppose that's my background is uh, I didn't study photography. I studied modern languages. And to me, photography is much more like a modern language uh, than just an art. I think... Uh, it would be like saying language is literature. Uh, you're limiting it to one mode of communication. And I think photography is not just art. And I think to th this uh, idea that um, you have to be given a pat on the head <coughs> by art or the art world is, is limiting photography and the scope of photography itself. For me, always the advantage photography had over art was that it wasn't art. It didn't have to conform to a sort of 19th century idea of visual culture. Um, uh, yes. Um, so I th one is, I think, assured of restricting, even distorting the different photographs, the way different photographs might be interpreted by presenting them in the context of art. Um, and in any case, I think... Uh, <laughs> I, this is definitely art. <laughs> yeah. In a way, contemporary art has only dragged itself into the 21st century by uh, parasitically feeding off video and photography and these other visual media to a large extent. Um, yeah, so basically I'm, what I'm saying is I'm uncomfortable uh, mm. with, with the, the idea. Um, um, even though I wouldn't turn down, you know, uh, having a print bought by Tate Mod and uh, when, I, <laughs> when you see the prices that are paid for some of these prints. Uh, I, there was a quotation, actually, having quoted Diane Arbus about this, which I thought summed this up for me. There's a, there's another, there's a guy called David Vonyarovich. I don't know if any of you have come across him, who was um, one of these artists around the time of Robert Maplethorpe, Peter Hujar, and that sort of age generation of New York artists, queer artists. Uh, who hated, who was a photographer, who was a collagist, a painter, a writer, uh, wrote novels, 
uh, memoirs, um, all kinds of stuff. But he hated being pigeonholed, as I, any of those things. Uh, and he said his reason for taking photographs was this, and I like this very much, this quotation, I saved it. To me, photographs, this idea of photography as a language, he said, to me, photographs are like words, and I generally will place many photographs together or print them inside the other in order to construct a free-floating sentence that speaks about the world I witness. History is made by and for particular classes of people. A camera in some hands can preserve an alternative history. So he also brings into play this idea of class. You know, what are you doing when you're talking about, phot and who is it who's talking about photography as art? Uh, and are you excluding people who, who could be who could participate in photography by uh, presenting it as art, necessarily. So, yeah, some loose thoughts. I, I, I've got this image up because, um, because it's one of the better images, obviously, in the sequence. <laughs> and I, I, we, we had an interesting conversation about this because people always laugh when I say that I'm a photographer and, like John, I take lots of photographs, but I don't really like having my photograph taken because I think it's a... I think it's quite common with the photographer that they like to sometimes, with some of the more important photographers throughout the history of the medium, you tend to see them represented in self-portraits because they have a control over what it is they're doing and how they're being represented. Um, but I just want to mention this sequence. This is actually, I'd been off on, i just finished my PhD and went off on a trip to speak at a conference. So I went on a research trip to New York and San Francisco and I'd got back that day. So this idea of the journey is interesting that I just came back. And John had given me this suitcase, and perhaps you can speak a little bit more mm. about left luggage, that I filled with just things I'd picked up along the way on this four-week trip to the United States. Um, and it was interesting then, if you think about journey and collaborations, and the way this became, for me, the, the bridge became a sort of magical place that one would return to, and, and then new collaborations would emerge. So, yeah, this is one of those occasions where another project has contaminated this one. This is an ongoing project which, which dies on me and, and resurrects itself every few years. So it's a sort of it's a very slowly ongoing project. I, I inherited this. So this is a good example, actually, of a journey literally being interrupted in its tracks. It was James's journey. Um, it's called Left Luggage, and, the, and it's actually online and I've had a few people I've collaborated with on it um, and th this suitcase I inherited from my grandfather who was a sea captain um, we had th there are initials it's a monogrammed suitcase the initials are exactly mine we have the same name so it's JDP is on the top we had the same birthday we were actually <laughs> one yeah the same day so I inherited this suitcase and didn't know what to do with it. And I felt very sad because it was sitting by my desk that this suitcase, which had traveled, literally traveled around the world many, many times because he used to go everywhere with this thing. I might add it's a very, it's leather and it's one of those very heavy suitcases. So it's from a, an age where you had someone else carry it. So he obviously had you know, somebody else carry this. Uh, so I decided I'd set it off on, on a new series of journeys. So I, I started lending um, my suitcase. James was, are you the last one? or I think you're the one before last. I think you're the penultimate person who took charge of it. I would give this suitcase, or I still, you know, still looking for collaborators. I, I give this suitcase to my collaborator for a month. And then we agree to meet a month later, and they can either fill the suitcase with different things. Um, in one, on one occasion, somebody left the suitcase completely empty because they didn't want to be, they considered themselves to be a sort of free floating individual and didn't want to be held down, you know, weighed down by possessions. Then we meet after the month, open the suitcase, and I photograph the contents. And, and video, usually an interview, uh, 
uh, where my collaborator tells me why they chose these objects. So, and I, you had all kinds of stuff in there. Yeah, right? and it's, you feel a bit like Paddington on the tube. Yeah. Which is fun. As well. One of the more interesting ones was Omar, you know Omar Garcia at QMW? He was a, who was a Cuban exile, but um, so he filled his suitcase with eggshells because when his family left <laughs> Well, actually, no, he left with the Marielle boat lift. So he left in 1980. When he left, uh, he remembers the, his last memory of Cuba was going down to the boat and being pelted by eggs from, from Cubans. So he filled, the, I opened the, the suitcase, it was just full of egg, broken eggshells. Uh, um, one of the things that I thought might be interesting to speak about is, is your approach and how it is that. I mean, but when I take photographs, or I, I show someone the portraits that I've taken, they said, do you just stop someone and, and take their photo in the street if there are photographs they've taken in Cuba, for example? Um, and I find that that's the most common question I get asked, so I wondered if perhaps you could respond mm. to that. That's a bit mysterious, why, how I choose people. And I ask myself this question often, and it, in the end it comes down to a very spontaneous and sort of gut-like feeling that you make contact, you, you encounter somebody face to face, and it's either you make eye contact, or they talk to you, or there's something, or you're very, you know, sometimes I'm some piece of clothing, because that's the other thing that comes, clothing, I'm quite interested in, in sort of capturing, documenting what people are actually wearing between 20, 2011 and 2000. So it's that, that sort of social documentary a bit. Um, yeah, so it's often something I can't put into words, what the criteria are. Um, once I've made the decision, and it's not me who makes I just physically just go at that moment, because if you miss the, the, that split second, you've missed the shot. So it's, um, I'm off. And at that stage, uh, I have printed cards. It's formal, you know. It's become increasingly easier when I say to them, you, you know, I've taken 200 pictures. I've been here since 2011. Would you be part of this? Um, and at that point, it's surprising, actually, how few people refuse. I'm very surprised by this, but they don't. And what is it, I ask myself, that makes them want to have their picture there? And I think it's sort of, it's, again, it's this idea that they're interrupted. It's a diversion from, uh, from daily routine. Maybe they, for the first time they've stopped in this space and actually it's interesting. Um, and maybe it's the idea of, in such a large city, that your presence is remembered or you're you're documented as being part of this big thing which is which is a, a sitting I, i've got two final questions before we yeah. open it up one of them was um just if you could say a little bit about we you've hinted already that you're nearing the completion mm. of the sequence as gradually getting to number 300 um and just to say a little bit about how you envisage the the series having a sort of afterlife after you finish taking photographs I've no idea, and I'll, I will know. Uh, at, it's actually uh, um, weighs on me because you know my last exhibition. I did an exhibition in Scotland in, um, in last winter, um, and it was fifteen prints, right? Fifteen large prints. So that's manageable. I'm thinking, what the hell can you do with three hundred? You know, three hundred prints. I've never exhibited uh, on that scale uh, so that's that's somewhat uh, daunting um, but I, I think the way I usually work is I produce a self-published book and from there I have something I can present to uh, and then the next step is finding a collaborator again a curator and there there's damn few of them, uh, as the Scots would say, in days old deed, but that's another <laughs> mad. So at that point, you have something you can talk about. Because for me, 
exhibiting something is not just hanging it on the wall. It's creating something new with a body of work, which is not there in the, just in the, in the work itself. So I think book exhibition and online presence, I mean, that's, that's probably how you get the most viewers. And the last question that we've got to Darren Coyle, the, the poet. Yeah. Um, I, when the last, the, 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 comment, the discussion got quite spicy on Sunday night after I mentioned street photography. Yeah. And that I was cons thinking about how this all fits with, with this term street photography, or this sort of sub genre of, of, uh, of um, photography, street photography. I used street in brackets because I was sure that I was going to get some sort of reaction <laughs> from John, and that, as he said, you see this as portraiture, and I think this might be a nice way just to end our conversation before opening it up, is just mm. to think about how you see this in relation to other genres in photography. Well, I mean, street photography has come up, and I'm, I'm sure nobody's ever known what street photography is. I mean, there are two very difficult terms there. First of all, you know, the photographers we associate with uh, street photography are of a very distant era, usually, working uh, f with cameras and with technology which very few of us use anymore in, in a street which was very different. I mean, what is a street? Uh, what, what is a street nowadays? You know, I, when I think of street photographers, Cartier-Bresson, or Gary Winogrand, or one of these street, for, you know, who never use the term themselves, I might add. You, street implies a very public space. The commons, I think, is what it implies. It implies a shared space, public space. And that's very rare, particularly in London, where everything is privatized. One of the reasons I chose the bridge is that it's virtually one of the only bits of that bit of London which doesn't belong to a bank or the, or the Corporation of London. Um, so, yeah, what is a street, uh, especially, and what is, a, what is photography in a visual matrix where everything is about flow and motion through the city, usually with the aim of shopping? rather than stopping terrorism, it has to be said. Um, and what is the role of, of, of st stillness, still photography within that flow? Um, I mean, I'll end mm. with, um, with that idea of stillness, perhaps, in, in the sort of modern street, this, this fluid sort of space, this privatized space. And I, I always think of, of Aristotle's politics. I mean, he uses this word stasis. Uh, I think it has a political uh, you know, dimension, this stillness. He uses the word stasis, not in the negative term we use nowadays, but stasis is this very um, subversive, he m mentions stasis in the politics at the moments when democracy comes to a crisis point uh, and there's a standoff. In, in ancient Greek, stasis means to stand your ground, to stand motionless, to stand against. Um, so I, I think actually in, that, in the context of a sort of the capital city of capital, which is London now, and with the sort of memory of sort of Occupy outside St. Paul's, this idea of standing your ground, that, that, uh, that standing still to take a photograph, God knows, I mean, ph photographers get stopped all the time because they're standing still, particularly in shopping malls, because everyone's moving. The photographers dawdle and they stand still. And that's when you get security guards and police and people saying, why are you standing still? <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's as good a place as I need to end. Good. Uh, Cecilia, could I hand over to you? Yeah. Please. Thank you. Is it okay if I speak from here and bring some the... No, I don't. Just put the slide oh, chair on. That's it. Should I, I can stand here. Yes. Um, 
So I'm very happy, actually, that we ended on the note of politics and stasis, because that's kind of where I want to begin um, with my short comments uh, on, on this dialogue. So um, obviously, as a cultural geographer, I'm, I'm very intrigued about the role that the bridge plays. So we started with talking a lot about the bridge, and now we're going to end and talk a little bit more about it. Um, so we're talking kind of about the bridge in two ways here, so as a stage and a backdrop, but also as a performative kind of key protagonist in these pictures, just as the, the, the people themselves. And I think it's very interesting you're talking about the materiality of the concrete and the skin of the concrete, mm. um, and also the skin of the people. So, so making the materiality of the bridge organic, in a sense, which I think is, is and we were talking about the light and how it changes, um, just as our skin changes as well, according to, to time of day or, or, or season. Um, and I think this idea that materiality is organic is very political, actually, because um, we're often, but it's not fixed, it's not dead, it's not something which is just there. You know, it's not a given. And I think today you're often, um, we're often led to think that our material surroundings are something which is just there, that we cannot interfere in, and that they have this kind of natural fixed meaning. So, so as we were talking about, like a bridge is for passing through. It's not for, for stopping. Or you would have like the idea that benches are for sitting on. It's not for homeless to sleep on, for example. Or that train stations as well are for people that commute and not people that, that sleep there. And, and this idea of this um, givenness uh, and the idea that materiality is not something which is just there. Actually, it changes according to our social practices within it. And you're changing a little bit the materiality of the bridge by having people stop there. And also by capturing it in your pictures and showing the different variations of how the bridge also reflect the people on the picture. You had a, a good picture of a woman and, and she was quite dark and the bridge around looked quite dark as well. Uh, which I find really, um, really interesting. So it kind of shows that the city is not something which is just a backdrop for us. It's something for us to put a mark on. Um, and you're also talking about how the attempts of keeping it clean sometimes and cleaning it up and, and removing the traces of people in there. And I think if you look at cities today, there's, there is this kind of like crazy craving for everything that is polished and clean and doesn't show that anyone was there before you. Um, and I think this is quite problematic because it actually takes away our possibility of, of identifying ourselves with people that were there before or people that used it in different way or showing that one bridge can be used in many different ways, both as a studio and as a home and as a, a, a place for collaborations and so on. So, so this traces of use and this idea of sharing space I think is, is really, really great and has a political meaning I think exactly in, in, in that sense and it has a very emancipatory power to it I think because it shows us that we can actually engage with our surroundings and our presence does impact our surroundings and that gives us a kind of a hope I think so mm -hmm. so I want to end this on a very hopeful note um, about that um, and the political potential in that regard and then I would like to um, and this is something maybe we can keep discussing uh, in the questions but I'd like to just uh, end with a question to the two of you regarding a little bit that because you were also mentioning this idea of how these pictures can create an alternative history. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm interested to hear a little bit more about that, like what, what kind of alternative is this? And also you were mentioning the idea of whether it is an exclusive history or an inclusive history. And that also, I think, comes to the idea about the photography as a language. Is it a universal language or is it for people that knows it? Or if, if you'd be happy to expand a little bit about that, and then we, we will open up for, for some questions. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think perhaps what's interesting with these photographs, context is everything. Okay. So, thank you, Cecilia. The, once you have that additional information, so John spoke about the, the woman who became pregnant, and then you sort of map on those ideas, that, that context to that image, and you read it in a different way. And I remember in our conversation, I said to John, I've I always liked that image, but with this sort of added story, it gives it this additional element. So I think in this sense, a lot, in, in terms of sort of interpreting the photographs and thinking about what they have to say, I think it will be important how they're presented. If they are presented at one, two, three hundred in a sequence, um, this idea of them not actually having names, so they're anonymized, is 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 important, and I think that therefore, as you said, that we there's a sort of imaginative reworking of these photographs depending on our interpretation of them, and I think that's fundamental to the way that this series works, at least in my opinion. John, how would mm. you feel? Yeah, um, I agree entirely with what both of you have said, but there's also juxtapositions. I mean, particularly when I've rephotographed somebody, which has happened several times. And you put the two photographs together, there's a story there just uh, visually. And I think if we go to the PowerPoint, remember, mm. James, there was one of, a, of um, one young man I photographed at different points in his life. And I thought it, it was um, very suggestive. Yeah, and that's another one. The, the, the young um, woman, if you, yeah... Go back. That yeah, that picture. Note that picture, and then go back to the picture of the young woman no. with the elderly gen gentleman. Yeah. Now that uh, woman is the same woman who I had photographed previously, who had been homeless. And when I photographed her, I was very happy to see that she wasn't. She was well, r better dressed. And this, uh, this elderly gen gentleman had actually helped her. You know, a, a lot of, most of the people I meet, the homeless people under the bridge, have uh, drugs problems. You know, most of them are on heroin. Um, and she was in rehabilitation. She had found a home, uh, and that's, that's one occasion. The other occasion which was quite interesting was that, do you remember the young man with the spiritual healing, it, it's, mm. it's in one of this. Did we pass it? Or Did we pass later? it? Or I think it actually might be at the end, right? Right at the end. No. No. Uh, you have a. Pre you don't have the last version I sent. <laughs> Okay, well I do, and I'll tell you what number it is so we can look it up, because I think that's quite a nice, nice juxtaposition. Um, <coughs> right. It's picture 76 and picture 206. Okay. So if you go, um, not to slideshow, but yeah, up there, up to the grid. Yeah. And then you can go down, <coughs> go down, go down. You get a sense of how many photographs. Yeah, mm -hmm. go down. That's it. That, go up one. R extreme right, that's number 76. I photographed that young man, um, <coughs> 17th of November 2011. So pretty early on. This one, yeah. uh, so I quite like, I mean, he was, he's, uh, I, I kept seeing him quite a lot. But then I photographed him again this year, 27th of November, 206, I sense. So it'll be sort of fairly near the end. Um, where, where, yeah. You might have missed. No? No, go on. Uh, yeah. I remember the one. Mr. Uh, Duck there. Uh, yeah. And that's him in... Oh, 2014. Yeah, 14 rather than 16. Yeah. 
So should we open up to questions? So that's a, yeah, an entire sort of arc, biographical arc you have there between the two photos. Yeah, why not? I'm sure there are questions. I can see lots of students. Anyone? Yeah, start with that. I was kind of interested in terms of, I mean, you said you took the first photograph and you weren't sure what it was going to be as so you just took the picture. Yes. Um, but I was curious as to how you decided on the frequency and the staging of photographs as you went on. Like mm. if you go back to the, at the same, same dates each, each month, no. or you fluctuated? It was uh, practical more than anything else. I, I have tried to go back, well, I have managed to go back at least once a month. And there's a simple reason for that. I don't actually live in London. So I, I am, most of the pictures, I, I was living in Nottingham. Uh, but now I live on the Ayrshire coast. So that's quite a journey to come down <laughs> once, a, once a month. So, and that's one reason why the series is coming to an end. It's unsustainable. <laughs> yes. Any other questions? Mary. Um, thank you very much. That's fascinating. I've got a couple of questions, and I won't try and hog too much time. Um, you kind of talked really beautifully about the, the bridge kind of being a link between lots of different sectors of London. Mm. It struck me that it, it was almost like a hybrid space linking these different city dwellers. Yeah. Um, and you also talked about the performative aspect of taking these photographs. And I seem to recall, um, particularly in relation to portraiture, the description of the photographer being a master of ceremony, so directing the course of events and bringing mm. these together into the frame. So I wondered how you felt about that in your particular role within this sort of sequence or the theatricality of bringing these portraits together. Um, the question about what brings the journey to an end, you've already answered. Um, but also it strikes me that, that, you're, that this now project, if it's been completed, is a mixture of portraiture and obviously a study of portraiture, but also a social documentary. Yeah. Given the nature of the changing space mm -hmm. and how socioeconomic factors have affected that same space that you've mm. returned to time and time again. So mm. maybe inadvertently it has become a social document yeah. project without the sort of initial intentions. Well, I'm, I'm certainly much more comfortable with the idea of social documentary than street photography. <laughs> um, as to the sort of uh, question about being a master of ceremonies, uh, you have to take into account where this is. This probably, Shoreditch has the highest concentration of show-offs <laughs> in the whole city. This is a bad example. Apart, apart, <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, people don't, a lot of the time, people don't need much encouragement. Uh, I mean, I've, and, and actually, a large number of models mm. live in that part of London. So I often realize after I've approached some that uh, 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 this is a model because I say w would I take your picture and they're either too busy because they're going off to a proper shoot where they're going to be paid or I get this you know uh, they go yeah <laughs> you know like this so uh, there's some where, where that's not a mod but there are others where it's very clearly that they're, they're either performers literally performers musicians um, fashion people or models. Um, but the other strange thing is also there's, it's got one of the highest concentrations in London of photographers. <laughs> so I've had occasions, there's a, uh, there's a picture of me there by another photographer who stopped me and said, that sounds like an incident, let me take your portrait. <laughs> so so um, there's a lot of people taking photographs or selfies or there's a lot of photography going on in this space well not in the under the bridge um the bridge is my sort of uh, yeah improvised theater or whatever i've sort of occupied it in a way photographically it's a, i consider it a sort of form of occupation yeah but i would add as well this as a sort of witness to this going on i'd say it's very important the way that john communicates with those participants and as you say it is actually quite formal and John will give them a card and it's almost an exchange I'm going to take this photograph you're going to be part of this this series and become part of this sequence and I think you operate in a different way to a, 
a lot of the photographers who work around there and mm. it's a different type of approach and I think that's that's important I mean the main di sorry uh, sorry to interrupt but the main difference I think between this and street photography is that the street photographer snatches the shot shot and takes off and and avoids I mean I've seen films of Gary Winogrand who, I mean, who's a photographer I greatly admire I mean don't get me wrong but on occasions because he's quite in your face people say what the hell you know what the hell are you doing you know and he says just surviving and then he quickly makes an exit or you see those films of Cartier Bresson where he's literally <coughs> dancing through the streets mm. and he skits off and nobody notices him whereas what I'm really looking forward here is that face to face the encounter you know the face that that's why I avoid people wearing sunglasses wearing headphones or looking into their phones, you know, that, that sort of thing. Just, just, just to follow up, no, 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 no. Um, following up from that then, there's that, that question of authorship, obviously, of the image, particularly portraits. So do your subjects have access to their own image? Are they out on the web? Can they access Absolutely. That That's the first yeah. place they, they go to. And the card, the reason I give the card is because there is one... <laughs> one uh, scrap of paper where I said this picture has been removed because the, the subject thought she looked pretty and it's a quote so pretty evil in the picture um. I didn't think she looked I rather liked the portrait but I removed it mm. I mean, there's a, I'm not going to sort of just upset people for the sake of it you know mm. Hannah but there, are other, um, there are quite a few actually because I looked at the whole sequence mm. earlier there are quite a few which are not people Yes. So like, there's a feather and there's a crutch. Yes. And there are actually, aren't there another two text ones as well? Yes, like there's the text. Son, the, the father and the son. So I don't yeah. know if you could say, because the, the one, the feather there, that, that one, one. Mm. is that that one? Um, I think it's got a caption. No, it's not that one, is it? No, it's not there's, there's another, there's a, there's I don't know what you mean now. The one with the... Yeah, I, it's like a, I can't remember what number that it's is. It's a symbolic it? representation of a person. That's it. That, that, that one, yeah. It says, I can't read it, but... Oh, a woman with a scar across her face. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't want to approach that. I didn't want to make her feel uncomfortable, but I wanted to record that, mm. that moment. But also, yeah, it's, again, it's the materiality of the space. As important as the feather is actually the paving stone underneath. Mm. And I think the contrast between the two actually really gives you that... that but don't you think... By, by not approaching her, you're kind of saying something about what's acceptable. So you're maybe reinforcing ideas of beauty, I, uh, ugliness, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I think mean, Google's, I was... Google's motto is do no harm. And actually, I was perhaps erring on the safe side. I mean, the last thing I want to do is upset someone. Yeah, but if someone, I mean, uh, and if you said to someone, I think you're, you're you know, I, I'm attracted to I, 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 I want to take a photograph. I think you, you know your face is really interesting. Wouldn't that be better than kind of a denial of? Perhaps not for this type of project. I would do that if I had a long period of time to establish a relationship with somebody. But this sort of quick encounter. I don't know. It's maybe this idea of, of that you're pretty sure that the person, the public face they're presenting, they're pretty comfortable with that. Mm. I don't know. It's, it's maybe my... Again, is that... I react on that physical impulse at that moment, and at that moment I didn't feel secure in myself mm. in actually doing that, mm. approaching her. Yeah, so... So that series that you do There's a few of them here as well, that's in America. There's actually one of your colleagues, Natalia Sobrevilla. So, Sobrevi, yeah. yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you about that series you did where you found pieces of paper which were yeah. notes. And I, I mean, used to put them on Facebook, but mm. I found this absolutely fascinating because it would be a note, what it seemed to be anyway, was um, a note that somebody had thrown away which told an incredible story. Mm, even suicide notes. Yeah, I found and, one and of so an attempted suicide. What I find different with this is that there was this sort of violation of 
the private space by mm. staging that photograph. And yet that was okay because these notes presumably could be mm. thrown away. But the difference between that and this, you know, with enormous, because you've got an enormous respect. Yeah. Um, um, but I love that series. I wondered why it started. It's still online. It's on. Um, what was it called? Oh, it, one of the texts, it was usually texts, I, somebody had scrawled on the wall, and I thought this is, uh, encapsulates the existential reality of living in this moment, it was um, I, something like, I don't remember my own, I don't, and it was Miss, no, don't apostles, my own phone number. Don't re rem remember my own yeah. phone number, number. Yeah. don't remember my own phone number. Um, and I thought, yes, that's, yeah. that's so it. You've got sort of one side of conversation, somebody trying out ideas. What's this person think when I said that? Or, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sorry we threw uh, a stone and broke your window, Mrs. Hodges. We didn't mean to. <laughs> We're sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, Maybe got time for one or two more questions. Um, just following up on Hannah's point, I was just wondering whether you could say a bit more about perhaps you touched, you used the word document a few times. And, mm. um, I was wondering perhaps maybe you could say something about um, a perspective in which what these these photos and their photos that, that you've chosen um, to take. I mean, you've selected them. Mm. Um, what they're, what they're trying to say or whether they're, they're commenting about the world in which mm. they're situated rather than just simply being a random collection of photographs about people passing under the bridge. Neither one nor the other. It's not a comment, but it is in that... I see that it's in that vein... I don't know if you're familiar with August Zander's work, a 1930s German photographer who set out to record, to pr uh, present, and it was an epic series of photographs which was, part of it was destroyed by the Nazis um, because he included um, disabled people, he included um, homosexuals, he included uh, um, transvestites and things like this amongst the farmer and the doctor and the lawyer. So it was this idea of an encyclopedic survey. So in a way, I've tried one of the things I've had when I'm on the street, if I photographed three men in a sequence, I, I think, right, the next three I want to be three women. Uh, I've, there, there is, to a certain extent, also a class, an idea of... So it's a way that I'm presenting a survey rather than commenting, that I'm presenting a, a, yeah, a, a, a sample of, of uh, representative types in the way I suppose there is a, a genre of photography called what's it called typological that stuff the Germans do a type of typological photography which which is sort of almost like botanical you know you're presenting mm -hmm. spe mm -hmm. specimens uh, which sounds nasty but it's it's that sort of idea of the sort of survey yeah two final questions from Eric and Juliana please mm -hmm. um, just in a way, my question sort of continues um, on that notion of a, a typology. I was just typology, wondering, yeah. I was just because um, my question was going to be: uh, you, we saw some images there that were, um, you know, like these, devoid of any text. There were some that had a little um, additional comment, and then there were some that were essentially photographs of someone else's. Text. And I was just wondering if you see the if you yourself um, identify some of these photos as in some ways not entirely self-sufficient. In order for them to take on their full meaning, they actually depend on the text. I mean, and it connects to what you said early on about how photography is a language. But maybe maybe sometimes we actually need to verbalise in order for a meaning to become mm. fully realized there yeah i haven't done it on the actual photographs but there is a, a fairly lengthy text which introduces the project and actually brings up in general terms my thoughts about uh yeah about london about concrete about 
the moment we're living in. So I haven't done it on the actual... I'm very wary of, of this balance between text and image. And I think it's very easy to, to actually explain this, uh, to actually have the image eclipse, uh, the text eclipse the, the image in a way. It's a delicate balance. And maybe it's not my job to do that. Maybe it's, it's actually an anthropologist or somebody. I could, you know, that's another level of collaboration or a geographer, you know. Somebody you hand these images over uh, and, and they provide, if not, they don't give you, you know, you don't provide information about the specific people in these images. But if it is a typology, you can begin to reflect uh, on, on certain issues, you know, which pertain to, to, to this particular place and this particular historical moment. Funny, Thank you. Um, well, I was thinking a lot about the whole sequence and the fact that you were saying, you know, if you were to approach a curator, you know, what dialogue would, would you have with that curator? And I was playing curator in my mind. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I was glad that you, you talked about uh, your interest in clothing, because I think that, for me, comes across incredibly strongly, a particular sense of texture and, and colour. And, uh, and, you know, as I was looking at the images, I was thinking, gosh, you know, Londoners are pretty damn cool. <laughs> they just look amazing. I mean, so there probably is a kind of shortest bridge in particular. Uh, but actually, the, the idea of kind of, you know, what would you do with a with a sequence like that? For me, it's it's an invitation to the kind of multi-layer narratives that you can construct of meaning. That. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and how you know I would pick a certain selection of images because they speak to me. Um, mm. You know, because of my place and space, you know, in, uh, in this life and in uh, my connection with London and, you know, in a different selection would speak on a completely different level to other people. So for me, the, the really amazing thing is, is that is what uh, photography does and to an extent actually what, you know, the art world can also do by sort of putting on uh, an, an exhibition and, and, and then the interaction that uh, the spectator has with these images. Uh, but it's also the reason why I like to work with uh, with academics. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the last uh, commission I had was actually a, a trip we did to Greece with a, a sociologist and a criminologist on the Aegean border right. between Greece and Turkey, and I uh, uh, did a series of photographs with this sociologist with our recorded conversation as I was taking her to what are now refugee major sites of migration and refugeedom, but uh, seen through the lens of my own family history, which is actually the exchange of populations between Greece and Turkey in 1922, because what people forget about that part of the world is that it's full of refugees who were already there. You know, the Greeks who were living along the Aegean were exchanged in 1922 and they're all of refugee background so th th we're working on that now and that again is one of this is what I like with photography is that it does um, invite somebody then maybe to to uh, present a narrative which reflects on the photographs not necessarily explains them um, but does that yeah Great. Um, so can I take the opportunity to thank you all for coming, uh, to thank Cecilia as a discussant, and to thank John for coming all this way and thank to you. talk to us. Thank you very much. Thank you.